Okay, so today we're going to be working with uh, the concept of direct variation and inverse variation, or sometimes referred to as indirect variation, but we're going to look at the direct and the inverse variation. Uh, direct variation is a really straightforward um, equation. It's an equation that is essentially a linear equation that passes through the um, origin. Okay, so all of these uh, direct variation questions today they will satisfy the equation zero zero or zero zero as an ordered pair. Um, all of these are written in one of these two formats. I actually like to focus on this format primarily. It's y equals kx, where k is some constant value. Constant meaning that it doesn't change. So for a given scenario, k could be two, k could be a hundred, k could be negative eight. Um, it's some sort of a number that seems to be our multiplier. And what's really, it's, it's essentially the slope. And if you look at this line here, its slope is 3, and its k value is 3. And so a lot of our work is going to be going into building these equations. And once we have the equation, could we find an ordered pair that would satisfy the variation? In other words, hey, what happens if, what if x is 8? You know, can I find y? And that's not a complicated process. We just, we plug it in, and 3 times 8 is 24, and our value is 24. So this is a pretty simple process to, to find those values. Um, but direct variation is going to always follow this structure, y equals kx. k is not allowed to be 0, but it is a constant value. So let's look at some examples. If we look at the first example, we, we're going to compare a person's hair length in inches uh, as compared to, uh, or varies directly with the number of years it's been growing. And so if we just write an equation that expresses this, we're remembering that y equals kx is the structure of our equation. Now, at this point, we haven't been told what k is. And so we're just going to have to write that L equals kn. We don't know what k is yet, so our equation's not complete. And that's the next step. Here in uh, part b, we're told that, there, that the longest mustache on record is known by Kalei. Kalayan Sain of India. His mustache grew four inches each year. So that would be our k value. So we're going to put k in. Now our equation is L equals 4n. Meaning that if we want to know how long the mustache would be, all we have to do is take 4 times the number of years he was growing it. This is a much better equation than just L equals kn, because now we know what k is. Well, finally, he grew it for 17 years. If that's true and everything was consistent, how long would his beard be? Well, if we let k be 4, like we did before, but n now is 17 years, 4 times 17, l is 68 inches. That's 5 feet 8 inches tall. Um, now, indes you know, independent of the fact that that seems crazy for someone to grow their mustache that long, the reality is this is a simple question. L equals KN is the structure or format that we're using. Once we knew that K was 4, we could put that in. And then now we can use this equation to find values. You know, this is what it was at 17 years. Well, what was it at 3? What was it at 7? We can continue to plug different ends in and find the associated lengths, just like we could to any equation. These are actually really simple equations to work with. Now we have a, a canoe that's being produced. And we're told that its weight of the aluminum canoe varies directly as its length, meaning that W equals KL. Well, this is great. We still don't know K. So we go to part B, where we were given K last time. This is a six-foot canoe weighs 75 pounds. Well, six and 75, which one's K? The answer is neither, because 75 is the W, or weight, and six is the length, or L meaning that I actually have 75 equals k times 6. Well, at least at this point, I could find k. So let's do that. If we divide both sides by 6, k is going to come out to be 12.5. And now that I know k is 12.5, I now have the equation that the weight will equal 12.5 times the length. So now, if we know that's true, we should be able to find 
the weight of any canoe just by measuring its weight. We wouldn't always want to put a canoe on a scale to weigh it. Maybe if we just knew this equation and we could measure it its length really easily, this would be an easy way to find the weight or predict approximately what the weight will be. So it's 12.5 times the length of the canoe, which was 16. If we multiply through, we end up with 200 pounds. So this canoe being 16 feet long turns out to be 200 pounds in weight. It's quite the heavy uh, canoe. Now, that was our direct variation. Now we're going to focus on inverse variation. Inverse variation works when the x is increasing that the y would decrease. So, for instance, um, if your speed increases, okay, then the time it takes to travel somewhere would decrease. The faster you go, the less time it takes. That's an example of inverse variation. And we're always going to look at one of these formats. I prefer to focus on y equals k over x. So dividing by x instead of multiplying by x gives us this inverse variation. And where this really ties into chapter 3 is in this uh, rational function model that we've built and worked with in 3.6. If we look at this example problem, let's just throw some numbers in here. Let's let x be 3, then let x be 1, 0, it uh, can't be 0 because that's a domain restriction. Then we'll go to 1 third, um, 1 half. Let's go there. Okay, so if I put 3 into the equation, I get 3 over 3, which is 1. No big deal. If I put 1 in, I get 3 over 1, which is 3. If I put 1 third in, I have to flip in times, which is times 3 over 1. That turns out to be 9. If I put 1 half in, uh, which actually should go here. Let's put that back there. 1 half, because it is uh, bigger than 1 third, and we're coming down on the x's. If I put 1 half in, that would mean I'd have to flip in times by 2 over 1, which becomes 6. So let's think about the 1 half being right there. As you watch the x get smaller and smaller, you'll notice that the y value gets bigger and bigger. That's evidence of this inverse variation relationship. Finally, let's do an example question of working with this. Um, we're told that the price P of oil varies inversely, which makes K over with the supply S. All right. We're also told that if the oil is sold for $19.50 per barrel, at 4 million barrels. Um, so I'm going to run for my price, it's 1950 equals K over supply of 4 million. I'll just use 4 to represent 4 million. So right now looking at this, I notice that I can find K. So I'll do that real quickly. I'm going to times by 4 and K will come out to be 78. So that means my actual equation is that the price of the oil per barrel will be 78 divided by the number of millions of barrels of oil. Finally, we're told we want to predict the price oil will be sold at if only 3 million barrels are sold. Now something to keep track of, if you decrease the production, that means that there's less supply. And if you know anything about economics and you've gone through that course, you know that low supply means high demand, means high prices. Okay, So we're going to have to see the price go up if we do this. And so the 3 million barrels would be the supply, the S. So in this case, P equals 78 over 3. Turns out that the price will have to increase to $26 per barrel. That's a 50 gallon drum when we say a barrel of oil. Now obviously that's not all pure oil, or that, that's pure oil, but that's not all going to be gasoline. We're going to have to refine it. And so questions come up of, you know, what's the cost? What's the legitimate cost of changing the amount of oil we produce? How does that impact the, the individual family? Well, hopefully that'll help you and, and we'll see you in class. Good luck.